so, so here is the patient care and ethics. As we mentioned, let's uh, go into the financial disclosures. Uh, the one that is relevant is that I'm, I, I'm an ophthalmo practicing ophthalmologist, and so when we discuss the ethics uh, based on optometrist versus ophthalmologist, it could be possible that my outlook is more uh, based on, uh, or, uh, towards uh, bias towards an ophthalmologist. Uh, and I'm also the uh, president of the Meditrade.com, the website that is uh, um, broadcasting this, web, this lecture. And as I mentioned, I'm a professor of ophthalmology. I train ophthalmo ophthalmology uh, residents and also the director of glaucoma services at Tulane University Medical Center here in New Orleans. So ethics is the science of morality or system of moral principles, um, and it's uh, broadly defined as good versus evil, or right versus wrong, wise versus justice, different ways of looking at it. Uh, Socrates looked at ethics as self-knowledge. A truly wise man will know what is right, do what is good, and therefore be happy. Whereas uh, in Aristotle's view, it's self-realizationism. Um, when a person acts in accordance with his nature and realizes his full potential, he will do good and be content with it. And, and so these, uh, uh, the Greek era of ethics is more towards a way of living and in their view, which is true even today, you do the right thing, you're happy, and so uh, you make a good human being. Coming to present day medical doctors, um, we are faced constantly with the moral dilemma of decision making. Um, it, it's it's uh, in making the assumption that under the right conditions, doctors will figure out ethical principles for themselves and generalize what they learn to their everyday moral opportunities. And it could be as simple as when you offer uh, a surgical a surgery to one of your patients, um, which happens on a daily basis. Every other patient that I see in my practice, they come to see me for surgery, right? And, and so the question always is, is this surgery that I'm proposing for this patient appropriate? Or is it something that I'm doing because I want to be paid for the surgical, surgical procedure? Um, and the question that I always ask myself is, uh, is it something that I would do on my pay, my dad or my mom? And if the answer is no, uh, the right thing to do is not to do it on the patient either. If even if you have a small doubt as to the appropriateness or inappropriateness of the surgery to the particular patient, don't do it. So let's uh, go into the eye care professionals as we see them today. Uh, they are the MD ophthalmologist and then the optometrist who are the ODs. Then you have opticians who uh, go through one year training um, and these are the people who grind glasses and, um, uh, con and, uh, and can also prepare contact lenses. Orthoptists who pre predominantly dwell with um, uh, extracular muscles um, and uh, uh, strabismus, and they help out the pediatric ophthalmologist. Uh, ocularists, who are the trained people who make uh, the plastic eye um, or the artificial eyes. Uh, the ophthalmic medical personnel, who are the people who work with us in, in our clinics. The certified ophthalmic assistant or the COA, certified ophthalmic technician, COT, and certified ophthalmic medical technologist or COMT. Every one of these uh, uh, personnel have a prescribed training that they undergo and uh, they come out with a diploma based on which they are employed and without that, um, and there is a scope of practice that each one of them is entitled to. So the current debate goes into the realm of scope of practice and what, and within that scope of practice, can someone do what they feel like without appropriate training? And that's the debate that's raging across the, the country, MD versus ODs. Ophthalmologists uh, spend uh, a lot of time training to be ophthalmic surgeons, and so they feel like all the surgeries um, related to the eye um, should be restricted to them versus optometrists who um, um, uh, have four years of training and they also uh, 
see and treat common ocular or diseases from the medical science point of view now want to expand their scope of practice to include some of these surgical procedures. Um, this may be financially uh, motivated or this could be purely from the knowledge point of view that they're motivated to expand their scope of practice. So we'll, let's go into the background of each one of these uh, groups um, and then we'll ask the appropriate ethical issues in relation to the MD training versus the OD training and where the patient safety um, lies in all of this. So uh, optometrists, the American Academy of Optometry was established in 1923. Um, um, there are about 20 optometry schools in the U.S. Uh, for, they undergo four years of undergrad training, uh, following which they have to apply to the optometry school. And the optometry school itself consists of four years of training. And uh, after the school, almost 90% of the optometry doctors who uh, graduate from the optometry school go into private practice of some kind. Um, about 10% of them may complete a one-year residency, uh, which could be like pediatrics, geriatrics, contact lens, neuro-optometry, etc., which is purely an observational slash medical uh, residency training. They do not do any surgical training that we are aware of. They do have their own CMEs and uh, their own boards, etc. Um, so the private eye care doctors that are trained for contact lens fitting and eye, eye glass exams, but because of uh, the new rules and uh, regulations that have been imposed across the nation, they're also now able to prescribe oral medications such as antivirals, steroids, antifibrotics, necrotics, narcotics, depending upon the state that they're practicing in. Um, they do uh, prescribe topical medications such as antibiotics and glaucoma medications, etc., uh, for the patients when needed. And in approximately five states, they inject medications in and around the eyelids. And in two states, they do have the right to perform laser and anterior segment surgery. So, who are ophthalmologists? MDs who specialize in ophthalmic medicine and surgery. So they go through uh, undergrad, following which um, they apply to the medical school. Um, they attend four years of medical school, followed by one year of internship. And then they apply to ophthalmology residency programs, such as the one that I run here at Tulane, uh, which consists of three years of uh, training, um, followed by one to two years of fellowship. More than 50% of ophthalmology residents who graduate out of our university systems, they go on to do some kind of specialty fellowship training, which may be one year, like the glaucoma fellowship I offer is of one year duration. So most of the retina fellowships are of two years duration. So uh, that's the uh, uh, background between the MDs and the ODs. So let's look at the surgical training because this is what the, uh, the current discussion is all centered around. Optometrists feel that they should be allowed to do some of the surgical procedures. Ophthalmologists feel that, it, that they are not trained to handle these surgical procedures and it should be restricted only to uh, ophthalmologists. So let's look at how the surgery, uh, um, uh, the surgeons, i.e. the MDs, um, are trained in this country. So our residents, during the three years when they come, uh, come on board, they initially learn surgery, surgical techniques, initially in the lab, uh, and then on pig eyes, usually, and then they go on to the humans, mostly on indigenous patients. Um, uh, and But the surgery is performed uh, under the supervision of faculty until such point that they can start operating as independent surgeons, which usually happens in the third year of their training. In the second half of third year of their training is when uh, these uh, residents are allowed to operate independently. Even then, it, it is in the presence of faculty who will guide them through should there be any complications. Now remember, most of this training happens on indigent patients. There's no denying this. Um, if we don't have the charity hospital system or the veterans hospital systems, it's going to be very difficult for us to train uh, surgeons. 
This is not only true for ophthalmology, but for every other surgical specialty. So the real question here is, uh, the ethical question that we should ask here in terms of ophthalmology residency training is indigent patient care, um, um, restrict learning on indigent patients, is this an ethical um, a way of, uh, of, uh, uh, of training? Um, do residents and fellows need 24-7 supervision while they perform the surgeries and learn in the process on these indigent patients? Do indigent patients, i.e. the poor patients um, in the society, um, do they, in resident and fellow run clinics, need to be supervised by staff 100% of the time? And who should operate on these patients, residents, fellows, or staff? Um, meaning that do these indigent patients have the right to pick the surgeon based on their uh, experience? Uh, of course, when a patient with insurance comes to our private clinics, obviously that paying patient will, is going to demand the surgeon, i.e. the faculty, to do the surgery. So he or she will never allow uh, a resident to operate on, on, on themselves, right? And that's the truth of the matter. Whereas the indigent patient who typically is poor and probably lacks insurance, uh, we, that we end up seeing either in the charity or the county hospital systems, um, and also the veterans for that matter, they're all operated um, upon by training doctors. Um, typically in ophthalmology, the residents, so typically in ophthalmology it will be the third year resident, um, either uh, or the fellow um, in the presence of uh, faculty. So the, the ethical question one need to ask, is this okay um, or should these patients also be given the choice to pick who operates on them? Does the patient have a right to choose who does the surgery? Do we need to inform indigent patients that training doctors will take care of them? Should training doctors operate on them? Do they get to choose the surgeon? Now, to the extent that uh, uh, I am involved in, in these training programs and being around uh, uh, training programs all my life, we really don't give a choice to the indigent patients. So we tell them this is what is available, and and I've never had a patient who declined care. But uh, we do um, uh, get the faculty to operate on patients who have difficult problems. If it is a complicated case, then a um, uh, a fellow or the staff will operate as opposed to a simple case simple cataract surgery in this case, um, that could be done by a third-year resident. Um, so the fellow, remember one thing, fellow had several years of intensive preparation before being permitted to operate without supervision. So the fellows or, or people or, or doctors who already finished their residency training and are capable of perform, performing independent surgery. So they're training to become a subspecialist. So I really don't see an ethical issue with the fellow operating as a, independently. Um, independent surgery by the follow to a lesser degree by a senior resident should not be considered as experimental surgery in that sense. So supervision versus independence, um, the, the, this question always arises in all training programs. 24-7 supervision of residents and fellows will breed an atmosphere of dependence and discourages independent thinking. It's extremely important to remember this. If uh, my resident is, uh, is depending on me for decision making right through the residency till the day, last year of the training program, then the real question that arises is uh, from the day that the resident graduates out of the program, he or she may not be capable of uh, making an independent decision um, in the middle of surgery, or when to do surgery, what kind of surgery to be done. So all of those kind of uh, judgment issues should be resolved during the training program. So once a sign off on the resident saying that he or she is uh, is an MD, finished, successfully completed the training program, then that essentially means that these surgeons are uh, completely capable of making that decision. 
Um, remember, these are the surgeons who will be operating on us in the future. So if you don't teach them uh, independence, independent thinking process, you may be putting the entire future generation of patients at risk. So this question has dogged the surgical community from um, from time immemorial. Going back historically, I don't know how many of you read the history of charity hospital systems and the screening programs and how this system came to existence. Um, uh, 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 the, the surgical training, structured surgical training programs came into existence in the early part of 1800s in this country. And um, uh, rich people used to go to, uh, this all took place in New York uh, because that used to be the most um, uh, um, popular, populous uh, uh, city state in the country at that point, um, and uh, and uh, mo most of the rich and the famous people used to get the surgeries done by uh, well-known surgeons, as opposed to the poor. And, uh, and there were a lot of poor people in those days compared to today. Um, they were all um, um, uh, operated upon by these apprentice doctors, surgeons who were trying to learn surgery. And uh, over the years, um, what has happened is the establishment of uh, charity hospitals through charity, uh, to, through donor, through a donor system came into existence, especially in New York City, and uh, that cast the the, uh, the present day training system. Um, and brought it into existence. Um, and um, that system continued for almost 100 years where all poor people are operated upon by the training doctors, whereas the senior surgeons would operate only on patients who are rich and can afford them. 1960s um, and 70s, with, uh, 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 when Medicare system came into existence, and uh, a whole bunch of um, middle class and lower middle class population gained uh, insurance, then the question became more relevant as to who should operate on who uh, and as to how uh, the training of the future surgeons should take place. The Meyer Committee in 1965 uh, looked in, uh, uh, has um, uh, he came to the conclusion based on numerous meetings that independent thought for making decisions, independent action based on those decisions as essential components of the later stages of surgical training while cautioning against limiting this independence. And so there's a lot of stress being placed on independent thought process and independent actions in the surgical training programs um, right through um, the history of surgical training. So the goal of training should be uh, to escalate independence as the year progresses so that the fellow becomes a capable surgeon by the end of fellowship. So the ideal surgical training should involve supervised training under the guidance of an expert initially, followed by the opportunity for decision making and performing surgery independently. In summary, a fellow should be given the independence to both run a clinic, make the decision to, and perform the surgery perform, providing the following criteria met. They have mastered the basics of surgery during the residency. They have assisted and performed several surgeries under the direct supervision and satisfaction of the supervising faculty. And they have recognized one's own shortcomings and to keep patient well-being to be the ultimate goal. Now, uh, a lot of this thought process came into existence because of Medicare system. And once Medicare was introduced in the country and a whole chunk of population suddenly obtained insurance, um, there was a shortage of patients, poor patients, on whom these uh, resident doctors could train. And, and then the issue became as to how to train these doctors. And, and so over the years, we have evolved into training these doctors so initially in the lab, then on animals, um, um, in, in case of ophthalmology, the, the pig eyes, before we let them do, um, train on, you know, operate on human eyes under supervision. That's the key here. You got to have qualified faculty supervising these residents. 
So the major moral decision-making process in this is this. The major goal in influencing moral behavior is to ensure that the faculty are in the loop so that as residents consider the moral dimensions of their lives, caring faculty have a chance to influence the outcome, which essentially means that, uh, the, that we as faculty have to influence these residents um, during the training process. So they, they have this ethical dilemma constantly um, uh, inbuilt into their system and ask this question, is this right what we're doing to this patient? Whether the patient can pay or not is immaterial. Now let's look at, that's how the ophthalmology training is, uh, uh, has been structured all these years and uh, we've been pretty successful in producing um, um, extremely well-trained ophthalmologists in this country. Um, and in spite of this, we do run into problems now and then, uh, but not major. And this is how approximately 450 ophthalmology, ophthalmology residents graduate every year in this country and go on to become successful ophthalmic surgeons, right? So let's look at the optometry scope of practice and what are the ethics involved in their practice. So, um, as I mentioned before, their training is restricted to four years of optometry school. And based on those four years, they want to start performing surgery. So, uh, in a lot of states, they've been going to legislature to uh, increase the scope of practice. And finally, they succeeded in 1998 to expand their scope of practice to perform an, uh, certain surgical procedures in 1998 which allowed optometrists to perform laser procedures and empowered the optom optometry board to determine the scope of care. And in 2004, uh, this was revisited and they, formed, they actually expanded their scope of surgical practice to the point that they can inject medications into the eye, use of scalpels in the eye, and refract and perform refractive procedures such as LASIK and PRK. So if you go to Oklahoma today, you can find the optometry doctors who are practicing optometry and on the side in, are able to inject medications into the eye, are able to use scalpels, um, to dissect lumps and bumps off the lids and perform refractive procedures. And so there are a few refractive centers manned by optometrists there. So between 1997 and 2010, uh, the state optometry boards across the nation have tried to expand the scope in um, 21 states. All were blocked except for two states. Surgery excluded by state legislators in Colorado and North Carolina. Now, if you look at the requirements that the Oklahoma Board of Optometry requires for these doctors, optometry doctors, um, to perform surgery, you will find that they state that the optometry doctor must be 21 years of age must be of good moral character. You, uh, you must have met the undergraduate requirements in, or a graduate of an accredited school of optometry conferring the degree of doctor of optometry. And that you must have passed the national boards part one, two, and three of the optometry boards. Um, you must have passed the laser therapy for the anterior segment course offered by the Northeastern State University, which is located in Oklahoma. So what is this laser course that these people are talking about? We'll go into that in a little while. So the current situation in Oklahoma, like I mentioned, optometry board does not make reported complications public because um, they, uh, uh, they, they, they just don't make it public. And so there is no way for us to know if there are, there was an increase in the complication rates in Oklahoma. And uh, the, the other, other uh, reason why they've been arguing that optometry doctors need to perform these surgical procedures is the lack of access in rural, um, uh, rural parts of the country. If you look at Oklahoma as a state, you will see that there is no increase in rural access. What has happened is that optometry doctors are referring to other optometrists in, in bigger cities um, 
when a laser procedure needs to be performed on a patient from rural areas. Imagine an optometry doctor practicing in rural Louisiana um, who typically sees about 20, 30 patients a day um, and, may, and maybe 10 of those in a year may need a laser procedure. Uh, how can he or she can afford to buy a laser um, uh, instrument and justify the cost, right? So what they did is to start referring these patients to a bigger optometry practice in a nearby town or city. Um, so the complications data is not available. The access issue in terms of rural access is a myth. We don't know the entire truth and it's an untold story. Let's look at Kentucky Optometry Association, which is the second state where um, uh, this bill has become a law allowing optometrists to perform surgery, similar surgical scope or practice as in Oklahoma. And of note in both these states, the bill was rushed through the House and the Senate and within one week the governors signed those bills into law. So what's happening currently, uh, optometry legislation is being debated in several states including Louisiana. Most efforts to expand optometry scope of care into surgery have been shut down. Specifically, I would recommend uh, everyone to read this Sunrise Review, which is the optometry scope of practice from Washington State, where uh, the the Optometric Association took the issue to to the legislative body and uh, the Health Department of Washington State. Um, uh, set up a committee to review the scope of practice and they came to the conclusion that optometry doctors are qualified to dispense eyewear including cosmetic lenses and provide free drug samples and devices to patients but they're not qualified to expand the scope of optometry and they did not allow office-based medical procedures by optometrists including laser procedures and they banned optometrists from using injectable drugs and from prescribing oral corticosteroids. They concluded that an optometrist training is not functionally equivalent to an ophthalmologist training. So with this background, let's go into House Bill 1065, which is the Louisiana Optometry Surgical Scope Bill, uh, which has passed through the House and the Senate and is currently uh, with the Governor of um, and we don't know if the governor is going to sign it or veto it. So what is this House Bill 1065? It gives optometry doctors the right to perform surgeries ordinarily performed by ophthalmologists. Specific surgeries include lid lesions, laser surgery for glaucoma, which means SLTs and uh, ALTs, arteroplasties and peripheral arteries, laser surgery following cataract surgery, i.e. capsulotomy and sticking a needle into the eye, i.e. paracentesis in an emergency situation such as acute glaucoma. They can also prescribe all medications related to eye diseases including narcotic medications. Now they did mention a whole host of uh, surgical procedures that they said they are excluding themselves from from. Uh, these include refractive surgeries such as LASIK and PRK, uh, PKP, DSAC and DLAC, uh, meaning any cornea of, uh, procedures, um, any procedure that needs to be done under general anesthesia, injection or laser into the vitreous cavity of the eye, removal of the human eye of a living person, surgery of the iris, uh, surgery on muscles of the eye, surgery, surgical intraocular implants, surgeries for suspected eyelid malignancies, tarsarophy, blepharoplasty, ortosis surgery, surgery of, of the bony orbit including implants, conjectival flaps, injections into the eye or retrobulbar injections. Now here is the kicker. They want the Louisiana State Board of Optometry, according to this bill, will have the sole authority on the optometry scope of practice, including the proposed surgery by optometrists, which essentially means once this bill becomes law, optometrists in the state of Louisiana don't need to come back to the legislature. They will be excluded from all medical boards. 
they can, their optometry board can decide what they can or cannot do. Tomorrow they say that they can do cataract surgery and that they have required training in cataract surgery. Lo and behold, they can start performing cataract surgery and no one else can say anything about it. So the central question that one needs to ask when we are faced with this kind of a uh, bill uh, that poses the ethical question, does the current training imported in optometry schools prepare them adequately to perform safe surgeries, utilize lasers, and prescribe narcotics? Optometry education, yes, they're trained to prescribe glasses, contact lenses, and perform basic eye exams, understand the basic concepts of some of the common ocular diseases such as glaucoma, diabetes, and cataracts. But, in my opinion, no, they're not trained to perform eye surgery, and they lack the extensive background medical knowledge to practice safe surgery. Remember, eye is not uh, something that is hanging out in free space. The eye is in the sockets, in the bony orbits, and the bony orbits are located in the skull, and the skull is attached to the rest of the body. And so the, the eyes are intimately connected to the rest of the body, and as we all know, a lot of diseases that show up in the rest of the body can be first can first show up in the eye. I mean, you think about diabetes, hypertension, vascular um, uh, gravis. Somebody was asking a question on that previously. Um, uh, you know, sarcoidosis, other forms of autoimmune diseases, they all can present in the eye. And based on those eye uh, examination findings, we can make a diagnosis of uh, some of these diseases that are affecting the rest of the body. So let's compare uh, the medical training of an ophthalmologist versus an OD training. So the medical doctor goes through four years of medical school. This is calling four years of undergraduate training. They go through four years of medical school, one year of internship, which is mandatory, during which time they examine hundreds of uh, patients um, under the supervision of trained faculty, three years of residency training in ophthalmology, which is also mandatory, during which uh, stage they perform hundreds of clinical examinations on patients and also perform at least 1,000 surgeries under faculty supervision. One to two years of fellowship training, which more than 50% of our graduating residents do, during which time they also examine patients and perform surgery in their subspecialty. Um, uh, and so they have a total of 10 years of training minimum. Whereas, look at the optometry school of training, where following undergraduation, they go to a four-year optometry school, and, they, and that's it. I mean, essentially 90% of the optometry is following these four years of optometry school. They go into prior practice or, or join some kind of a practice. Um, they have zero years of mandatory internship, no mandatory residency program. I, I like I uh, mentioned, they have one year of optional observational residency, which is less than 20% pursue, and it's only optional, and one year of optional fellowship program, which is less, which less than 10% again uh, uh, pursue. You look into the curriculum of optometry school versus a medical school, and you notice that they, are, they do receive some training in anatomy, physiology, histology, biochemistry, neuroanatomy, and pharmacology, and pathology, which in some ways is comparable to what we go through in medical school in the first two years of your medical school. What they lack is the extensive medical knowledge that comes in the last two years of medical school. They don't have any patient contact and, uh, which, which trains us to examine the rest of the human body. Their training is restricted only to the eyes and adnexal structures. So in the current surgical training programs, ophthalmology training includes approximately 1,000 surgeries in four years, whereas optometry training does not include any kind of surgical training. Um, there are some optometry schools, if you go through their websites, they're suggesting that they're beginning to incorporate some degree of training, and this includes giving injections into mannequins, into animal eyes, and injecting into one other, each other's um, eye. And that's the extent to my knowledge. And my knowledge is based on going through websites of uh, a lot of these optometry schools. So how do they propose to get trained in this House Bill 1065? Yeah, currently, 
um, um, passed by both the Senate and the, uh, in the House and is uh, in the hands of the governor. Whether he'll pass or not, I have no idea. They propose to take a four weeks or 32 hour course at the Northeastern University of Oklahoma. This facility is not under the purview of Louisiana State Medical Board of Examiners. The reason why I state that is anybody who does any kind of uh, uh, procedures in the state of Louisiana are automatically regulated by the State Board of Examiners. And this has been the case for the last 120 years. If this bill becomes law, optometrists will be able to perform surgeries on human eyes following a four weeks or 32 hour course which is not recognized or uh, by the Louisiana State Medical Board uh, and and so there is no accounting or accountability to their actions. Now we I, I did go to their website of this North um, um, Eastern University um, as to what exactly a typical course would look like. It's a course that is held on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Imagine the CME course that you're attending right now. Imagine that uh, you're exactly say, going through this kind of lecture series and then at the end of the Sunday I'm going to give you a, a, a diploma stating that you now you can, you're qualified to go and perform surgery. Um, and if you look closely, uh, there are a whole bunch of lectures on, um, on pharmacology, uh, some of the drugs, and laser and its applications to glaucoma patients, um, gonioscopy and laser lenses, laser trigoplasty, um, concepts and review and exams. Um, and, and review, overview of surgical instruments, etc. Now, a lot of this, according to, from what I could get, these are all lectures, and, and so I, and they may have some labs which I am missing in this lecture series that was posted there. But the entire course, if there are any labs associated with this, it's also included in these three days: Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And you can actually go in and look it up yourself. It is um, um, going to be held on July 11th, 12th, and 13th in Oklahoma. And if the bill becomes law, a whole host of optometric, uh, optometric doctors from Louisiana will be attending this course. And on July 14th, they will start performing these procedures here in Louisiana. There comes the ethical issue. And like I mentioned, Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners, um, all surgical and medical practice in our state is regulated by this board. This includes not only MD doctors, but other healthcare providers who did not attend medical school such as the podiatrist. Do you know that the podiatrists go through two years of surgical training before operating on your toes, whereas the optometrists want to do surgery on eyes following 32 hours of training? Remember one thing, in the state of Louisiana, a barber had to undergo 150 hours of training before he or she can even look at your hair, whereas the optometrist, if this bill becomes law, will be able to operate on your eyes following 32 hours of training. Will, uh, have there been any cases where optometrists were allowed to practice? Um, with this expanded scope of surgical, um, uh, surgical scope um, and have resulted in problems. We really don't know the entire answer. I mean, we, I, I did go through what is available on the web. Here is an example of a veterans hospital experience in Palo Alto, California, where the optometrists were allowed to medically treat veterans for glaucoma. In 2005, one of these patients seen in the ophthalmology clinic found, was found to have severe vision loss due to poorly controlled glaucoma. Following this, an investigation was launched and the Veterans Administration found 87 veterans um, lost some or all of their sight because of uh, poor management by the optometrist. So as of today, optometry doctors cannot um, uh, treat patients independently in the veterans healthcare system. The largest healthcare system in the country, administered by the federal government, the VA does not allow the optometrist to even see these patients independently. They are allowed to see these patients under the supervision of a, an ophthalmologist. 
So there are no shortcuts when it comes to patient safety, in my opinion. How can you legalize an education that has not been imported? I mean, clearly you can see that optometry education does not prepare them to perform surgery. Um, and and uh, the way they are going about is to ram a bill through friendly uh, state legislative bodies and uh, friendly governors who are willing to sign these, uh, these bills into law putting patient safety at risk. So the ethical questions that we need to ask, having gone through the background in regards to training of ophthalmologists and optometrists is as follows. Do you think what we are doing in our training by operating on indigent patients is ethical? Do you think the optometrists are doing the right thing by pursuing the surgical school bills while the legislature, rather than attending medical school or at the very least establishing a one to two year surgical training program in their school, optometry schools? Tough questions to answer. So when it comes to medical ethics, you need to look at the autonomy, the justice, dignity and truthfulness and honesty that is involved in in your day-to-day -day practice. A patient should not be lied to and deserves to know the whole truth about their illness and treatment. Now, based on this principle of telling the truth to the patient, and also um, there's one other uh, kind of ethics that comes to mind which is called consequentialism ethics. The consequences of a particular action form the basis for any valid moral judgment about that action, which in other words means the end justifies the means. So the end justified means when you talk in regards to ophthalmology training programs uh, would be that indigent patients or the means by which we are training the future surgeons in this country. And this is true across the world. Um, um, and uh, when you are involved with the training doctors performing surgery, obviously the complication rates are higher. But does the end justify the means? If there is no doctor who is willing to operate on the poor people for free, then these patients would be blind, which is what is happening in uh, a major area, major uh, in big countries such as India, China, and Africa, um, where you see 90% blindness um, exists, and 90% of this blindness is secondary to a simple um, thing called cataract, um, and these patients are poor, consequently they cannot afford to undergo cataract surgery. And, uh, um, and because of cataract-related blindness, families are getting poorer because the earning members are unable to continue with their uh, jobs. And we, it's, a, it's, it's a crushing statement against the current system that exists. Whereas if you have training programs where these poor patients can be operated upon, the patients win because now they're getting free care. In the process, the surgeons also uh, get trained. So it's a win-win situation. That's what I mean by the end justifies the means. We're learning how to be surgeons by practicing our skills on poor patients. Optometrists may be pursuing the only option that is left to them via legislature in their pursuit to gain more knowledge slash perform more procedures. I don't know, I cannot ethically tell you whether this is purely from the knowledge point of view that they want to do it or they want to do more procedures because there's more money attached to it. You can make a judgment call on your own. So in the MD training uh, at the ethics, justification is based on the fact that the patient knows that they are being operated on by trainee doctors. So we are telling the truth to the patients performed under the supervision of faculty and or surgeon. So in almost all the training programs across the world where an ophthalmology residency pro resident is being, pro is being trained, there's, almost, there's always a faculty who is training these doctors to perform safe surgery. And they have the knowledge and the background to handle the complications because of years of training and also the presence of trained faculty they know how to handle the complications. Whereas in the optometry 
scheme of training, they feel that they have the training to perform certain ophthalmic procedures. This is what they clearly told me. I went to the legislature, uh, to the House to testify uh, last year and this year, and I met with optometrists, and they're all good people. I'm not saying they're not. And they believe that they have sufficient training to perform certain ophthalmic procedures the way their uh, training programs are structured today. But they're not willing to subject their training programs to be supervised by independent medical boards like we do. And they are willing to substitute proper training with a weekend course with no consequence to patient well-being. Now this is where I really have a problem. Um, if they really want to offer quality patient care, which is safe um, to the patients, then they need to design a, such a, a, a curriculum that matches that of the medical doctors to some degree before they are allowed to practice surgery. I am not sure if the patient will be informed of the training differences between optometrists versus MDs for the same procedure. Uh, what I mean by that is, if a majority of the population, believe it or not, here in Louisiana, this is probably true across the nation, majority of the people don't know the difference between optometry doctor versus an MD ophthalmologist. Optometry doctors are also called doctors. And so whether when you go see them, they will, they insist on being called doctors. And so when you say doctor, they don't know whether it's a medical doctor versus an optometry doctor. And uh, I have a lot of uh, medical doctors the, in my community who don't know the difference between optometry doctors and medical doctors, in the sense that some of the well-known optometrists in the area are considered to be ophthalmologists by MD internal medicine doctors who keep referring patients to them for surgical procedures. And the optometrists so far have been referring those patients back to ophthalmologists, but that will change in the future. And when questioned, these internists tell me that they always thought these opt optometry doctors uh, were ophthalmologists. So if an internist who is an MD um, cannot or did not make the effort to find the difference between an OD and MD, how do you think a layperson walking on the street will know the difference between an optometry doctor versus an ophthalmologist? So if they do get the bill passed, and it becomes the law for the same procedure, i.e., let's take glaucoma surgery, laser, laser surgical procedure. Will the um, optometrist doctor tell, educate the patient that they are optometry doctors and because of this bill, they're able to perform this surgical procedure um, versus an MD ophthalmologist such as myself who has been trained to do this for a number of years um, so it's the same procedure that we're talking about, but different people with different backgrounds, different surgical training is, um, is going to offer that. Will they tell this to the patient? Using legislative means to obtain the license as opposed to the traditional and universally accepted uh, undergoing the required training qualifications. Um, there is a big ethical question here that they need to answer. Um, why are they pushing this? Why are the legislature in different states? It's, it essentially means they're buying a degree as opposed to going through the required, required training to obtain the degree the hard way. This brings you to the last and the final ethical um, uh, problem that I'll bring in front of you, the ethical yogi or the karma yogi. Healthcare professionals have to put patient safety first, a selfless action for the benefit of others without thought for oneself which essentially means that, you know, for the sake of few dollars, you're not going to offer a surgical procedure on a patient that you're not trained to do. I have a disclosure um, uh, um, at this stage. I am an ophthalmologist. I do train ophthalmology residents. I have seen and taken care of many patients with complications following optometry doctor's treatment, so my judgment may have been influenced by this experience. 